Acts chapter 2, we've been spending the last three weeks in a series called Heritage, really looking at our values as a church. We believe that these aren't just values that we came up with, but really these are kingdom principles, that, that God has a, 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 a word to show us that throughout uh, his word that he's given us, he has shown us who we are, what we're called to, our identity, our purpose, where we're going. And so we, we've talked through our first two values. The first one was first is first love. Last week was we are spirit led and our third value that we're diving into tonight, write this down, his word is our way. His word is our way. Have you ever been uh, in or around a body of water when it's dark outside? Just me, okay. Uh, I, I need to tell you, it's terrifying. I, 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 don't, I don't know about you, but I don't like to swim in ocean water or any, any body of water that I cannot see the bottom of. <laughs> It, it is quite terrifying. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, friends here in the church that love to surf. I'm like, you know what, man, I'll just stay in the shallow end. Like, you know, there's too many great whites around here. The, the, the ocean is a dangerous place. Can I get an amen? amen? Anybody, you're like, no, it's not. You're just scared. You know what? I'm wise. How about that? How about that? <laughs> the last time, though, I was in or around a body of water when it was dark was when I was a young boy. And to be honest, I thought I was going to die. My dad can attest to this. We were down here in, in uh, Australia. We were down in, in Bustleton. Uh, and you all know that jetty that just keeps on going. Uh, and now they make you pay to walk on it. When I was a kid, when I was a boy, right, it's like uh, how times have changed. But we were out there uh, late on one night, um, and we were fishing. We were doing some, some crab some crabbing, how about that? Or I, what were we doing, Dad? Fishing through the nest? I don't remember. It was terrifying. I'm, I have PTSD, okay? Pray for me. But all of a sudden, it was like this calm night, this beautiful night. And then all of a sudden, like this wind comes in and this rain. You know when the rain's sideways, you're in trouble? Y'all know that? And it was like the storm came. I like was going to fly off. My dad grabbed me. All of a sudden, I look and there's dolphins, y'all. It was like the most bizarre thing. Dolphins, lightning. My, my cousin's flip-flop flies off into the ocean and he's just... Gets down on his knees, crying his eyes out. No, he almost jumped in. We're like, you're going to die. I'm like, this is crazy. And my dad grabs me. We walk off. And by the grace of God, I'm alive today. <laughs> Near-death experience, y'all. NDE, come on. I live to tell the story. <laughs> but honestly, um, I was just on a, on a jetty. But my mind starts to think, because I recall this story. I'm like, well, what about the sailors that deep sea, right? What about like the ocean? Well, what about, what did they do like before we had GPS and, and phones and electricity? Like, what did we do before we had satellites? When they were just out there like looking at the stars and just trying to find out where to go. What happened when a storm, anybody else, this is what keeps you up late at night? You're like, man, the, the sailors of the early 13th century, like, hope they were okay out there, right? <laughs> but like this, the, the ocean is a crazy powerful Force. It, it is God's creation. The, 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 the power, though, that is at disposal, it's, it's just incredible. It's, it, it's wild to think that before even, you know, whether I'm on a jetty or I'm on a, a sea kayak or I can see where I'm going, it, it's, it's crazy to me that the ocean before airlines, right, what was just like the way to go. You wanted to go across the, 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 the globe, you would just get on a boat. You just hope to God you made it, right? Moby Dick might show up, but you just got to pray and hope to God that you get across safely. But it wasn't until something was invented that in the midst of the ocean that sailors would know which way to go. I, I think about that. How, how did they know? How did they know which way to go? And until 280 BC, really sailors, people at sea had no real way to know the exact way to go, especially when land was coming, especially when there were reefs or rocks or dangers ahead. And so in 280 BC, uh, humanity built the first lighthouse. And this was in Egypt. It was called Pharos of Alexandria. A little fun fact for you in case you care. It was not only the world's first lighthouse, but the world's tallest. You're welcome for that. That's free. 450 feet tall. But the lighthouse, hear me, was, was built for one purpose. And that was to show people at sea which way to go. 
It, it was to warn them. It was to say, beware or danger or don't go that way or come this way. Harbor is this way. The early lighthouses would have a light flame. They'd have a, a bonfire on top. And when the storms would come in, the, the flame would not always be that reliable, that visible. Over the centuries, there has become uh, 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 evolution in, in the lighthouse where now uh, current lighthouses hold the power of a million candles that they can be seen for about 25 nautical miles away so that whenever you're in the depths of the ocean, you're coming into land or dangers or perils, the lighthouse shows you the way to go. And I, I wonder tonight if a lot of us maybe feel like we're kind of lost at sea. <laughs> like we feel like we're kind of out in the storms of life. We feel like Man, I'm not sure which, which way to go. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the exact way. I, I don't really know if there's dangers. I'm just kind of living life, and I, th I think it's cool, and I think it's good. But could it be, y'all, that there is a light that is shining? A light that is shining through the fog and the storms that is showing you that, hey, there is a true way to go. There is danger ahead. There is obstacles to avoid. Could it be that there is a true light that is showing us the way to go? I believe I have a word tonight that will really, uh, I think, help a lot of you tonight who are feeling tossed and, and turned, you're feeling discouraged, you're feeling weary, you're, you're feeling uh, like your, your, your countenance has dropped, you're feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders, you're feeling tossed and turned in the storms. And I, I hear the vo voice of the Lord saying this, the word tonight, look to the lighthouse. Look to the lighthouse. You know, as a church, um, we've let go. Right, last week, I I'm letting go that, that I'm going to be spirit-led, that I'm letting go of my way, that, that God, I, I, I want to follow you. I want to, to walk with you and to be led by you. We've received, as the Word says, that, that as we come to know Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. We, we believe that God lives in us, that he is our helper. And what I really want to press into tonight is what is the light of this lighthouse and how can we follow it? So the word, look to the lighthouse. Somebody say that. Look to the lighthouse. In Acts chapter 2, here we go, here we go. Verse 1 through 4 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The first thing I want to share with you tonight is this. Number one, the Spirit speaks. The Spirit speaks. I don't know if, if you know this. Once again, it's another thing that keeps me up late at night. I'm kind of weird, but it's all good. I'm like, God, how many languages are in the world, right? And anybody else just wonder that? Yeah, great, all of you. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder, how many languages? It's surely like 1,000, maybe 2,500, maybe 3,387, right? Nope, 7,100 languages that are known are spoken across this earth. You know, some of you in this room, uh, you're, you're bilingual. Uh, maybe some of you trilingual. I don't know if this is a word. Quadlingual, is that a thing, right? For, anybody speak four or more languages? Ken and I, yes, you do. Come on. <laughs> Holy man. <laughs> But see, on Pentecost, there's all of these languages, but on Pentecost, man, y'all need to loosen up a little bit tonight, okay? I got to say that. Are you, you awake? You with me? Some of you. Okay, all right. Well, preaching is a lot more fun when y'all are leaning in. You're like, preach better. I'm trying. Pray for me. Okay. Pentecost, something so beautiful happened that of the known languages, there was a new voice given. There was a new voice that was given. The, the Spirit speaks. See, he fills the disciples. He fills those who are waiting on him, and they speak. We're told in Acts 1 that there is about 120 men and women in this space. They are all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they all speak. 
What do they speak? They speak the mighty works of God. In other words, they're, they're praising God in this tongue. They're praising God in this language. They're, they're praising God in this new voice. And the people, this is a feast, y'all. This is a, a feast moment. There's a lot. There's thousands and thousands of people who came to Jerusalem like this Mecca, like this sort of this meeting place from all over the world to come to observe this feast of the Passover. And now... Sorry, it's not the Feast of the Passover. It's a different feast. Pentecost. All right, great. Now, all of these men and women who are in this city, they start to hear the disciples speaking in this voice. They hear them speaking the mighty works of God. And I love this. So we need to just see this, to hear this. It says that the, the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. See, when the Lord fills you, there is going to be an action attached. That when, when the Lord fills you, that when he comes in you, he has given you something to say. The question is, what does the Holy Spirit say? You know, this, this light we talk about, this lighthouse, the, the reality is, is no matter how controversial some may say that this collection of words is, that the Bible, God's word, is the true light in this world. See, but some say, how is the Bible reliable? Or it was just written by men. It's fallible. I don't know if I can trust the Bible. And it's even more controversial, isn't it, when Christians claim that there is one truth. That when there is an objective truth, not subjective, Subjective is like when you go to Subway and you're like, yeah, I'll get the, I'll get the, you know, the BLT, but hold the, hold the, the lettuce because I, no, I don't eat no greens, right? But put a lot of the hot sauce. Right? We, we can pick and choose. It's, it's what we want. It's, it's what we think is right. It's what we think. And there's a lot of subjective truth happening in this world now. There's a lot of opinion going on. There's a, there's a lot of, 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 of a subway type faith, if you will. This, this pick and choose that I want this. I want God and his love, but I don't want his holiness. I want God and his acceptance, but I don't want the reality that I got to die to myself. I, I, want, I want God in his name, but I'm not willing to proclaim that he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. So you see, if the Bible is truth, capital T, objective truth, we don't like this as humans. Because if this is true, then this means that there are moral boundaries. It means that morality is real. It means that, that, that you can't just go and kill somebody and say, oh, I'm just a product of evolution and it was just my animal instincts that made me do it. You can't just go sleep around with anyone and abuse people and say, well, that's just humanity. There is morality. There is right and wrong. But we don't like this. The world doesn't like this because if this is true, then not only does morality exist and, and ethical boundaries, but it also means that God is real. And if God is real, then that means that everything that he said in this collection is true. That there is an eternity. That there is the reality of heaven and hell. That there is judgment. That humanity isn't as good as we think we are. But it also means that, yeah, there's the bad news, but also God loves the world. That God loves the world so much that he came down to earth, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, rose from the grave, and ascended into heaven that whoever believes and calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the good news. Can we trust the Bible? Can we, can we trust the Bible? Well, let me just give you, I don't have time to, to expansively prove to you there is a reality of, yes, there is physical evidence and there is historical um, uh, power behind the claims of the Bible. And yes, you know, a lot of uh, pagan and, and Jewish, Roman, Greek philosophers throughout the ages, they all claim that Jesus was a real historical being. But the tension of debate is, was Jesus God? Because if he rose from the dead, then guess what? That's right, he's God. <laughs> but Paul says this, if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this is all futile. This is all pointless. 
We got dressed up looking nice for nothing, for a country club. But the Spirit speaks. And the Spirit speaks of God's truth. See, the beautiful thing is, is when I read the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit in me illuminates. He shines a flashlight. He highlights things. I'll tell you, y'all. You know, I'm, I'm real big on, on, on uh, quality of reading rather than quantity of reading. Man, I read a sentence and I'm on my face. I'm like, I cannot get past the comma. Oh, my goodness. The, the, when, when it says, but God, I'm like, oh, I cannot get past that. Oh, my. You know, it's like we, we can read and read and read, but God highlights his word to us. He illuminates it. He shines the flashlight on this. See, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit speaks. Not only does he speak internally to our inner man, but he also speaks to us. And so we need to know that that, that the Holy Spirit speaks of the truth. John 14, 4 Jesus says this, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, God, Jesus in the flesh says this. He makes this claim that I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. And as we read the scriptures, we see that the Holy Spirit has inspired people throughout the ages to write down God's revelation. You know, Nathan Finocchio says this, that I cannot know, uh, I can only know God. Let me just say the quote so I don't mess it up. How about that? Yeah, pastor, that's great. He says this, that I can know the God of the Bible. That apart from the Bible, I cannot know God. And see, this is, this is the, the, the beauty of God's word is he has revealed himself to us. That the Holy Spirit has written the truth. That his truth is a lighthouse. That in the storm of life, that with all this confusion, all of these things going on, God just says, look to the lighthouse. Look to the word of God. Look to who I say that I am. Look to the creation of the world. Look, look to the end of the world. Look to my second coming. Look to what I did on that cross. Everything we need is in God's word. He's revealed himself to us. And so this is why Paul says all the time, like, get in the word. Right? Renew your mind. Do not conform. Don't, don't go down the path of confusion like the rest of the world. Swim upstream. Get in the word because the word will wash your mind. It will renew your mind. It will transform your mind. It is God's word, God's truth that is our true north. It is our lighthouse. It is our way. So if you're in a storm right now, you're feeling discouraged, weary, you're feeling tired, you're feeling hopeless, God is saying, look to the lighthouse. Look to his word. What does God's word do? It renews our mind. It reveals God. It sets the captives free. God's word heals. God's word, God's word breaks chains. God's word reveals that God is real and he has a heart and an intent for me and for the world. God's word reveals our identity, our purpose. God's word gives us answers. And that's the beauty of it, that this was written, y'all, thousands of years ago. And we opened this today in the year 2022 and God's word is so applicable. In every season, in every moment. And so God's word is our way. The spirit speaks. He speaks. He he gives them utterance. They they proclaim the goodness of God, the mighty works of God. There's an an internal praise that's happening. They're, They're speaking the praises of God. Just thank you, Lord, in this tongue. The people come around and they're like, what's going on, right? Some say, I'm curious. Some condemn them. They're drunk. But Peter, here's what I really want to lean into. Peter, in verse 14, full of the Holy Spirit, says that he stood up, that he raised his voice, which if we can just take a moment to highlight how significant this is, that just months before, Peter did not lift his voice when Jesus was taken. Peter denied Christ. 
Peter denied him not once, but three times. But now, what, what happened? How, how could he be so timid and so uh, uh, afraid and so even, may I dare say, full of this self-preservation that if I proclaim Jesus, I'm going to be on that cross too. <laughs> he denies Jesus. What happens to where he denies him to now he stands boldly and raises his voice and speaks under the unction of the Holy Spirit, the word of God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, my friends, that he gives us boldness, that he gives us the words, that he gives us exactly what we need to say. The question is, are we willing to stand? In a world of confusion, in a world of hearsay, in a world of ideology and preference and subjective uh, truth and, and, and statements and cliches, are we willing to stand in a world today and say, I will go for you, Jesus. I will lift my voice. I will pro proclaim your objective truth. It's scary. But I just hear this. This, this is my heart, y'all, that that I just, I'm like, God, I've seen too much. You've done too much. As the disciples that were walking with Jesus, they, they leave. And Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, are you going to go too? And they say, where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go, Jesus? You hold the keys. You are God. There is no one else. And that's my cry. That's our cry at this church. God, there's no one else. We're here. We're going to raise our voices. We're going we're gonna to speak the truth in love, but we're not going to shy away from the reality of God. We're not going to shy away from the reality of his plan and purpose. We're not going to shy away from his love. His word is our way. We're calling this city to look to the lighthouse. Look to God's word. He will guide you. He will lead you. The second thing is this. The Holy Spirit fills them, they, they're praising God, but now there is a public word. The question tonight is this, number two, what sermon are you preaching? What sermon are you preaching? If we read verse 14, it says, but Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Peter stands up full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine this, y'all. Like, there's thousands of people around. There's, like, the religious elite. Like, there's, like, imagine businessmen and women and, you know, high-caliber high leaders. And then there's this fisherman from Galilee. Right? And he stands up with, with his 11 brothers. And he, he, he starts preaching. And we need to understand, I, I just need to tell you this. Peter didn't, like, spend all night studying. You know, every, every Thursday, Friday, I lock myself away and I just study. You know, you, I've shared this before. I go stare at boats in the ocean, right? I'm a contemplative. It's great. Got my hot spot in the Holy Spirit. Come on. <laughs> But it takes time to, to prepare. It takes time to get these illustrations and hopefully be able to communicate this clearly to you all. And, and uh, you know, to, to go to the Lord and say, God, what, what do you want to say? It's not me. Let me get out the way. There's, there's time that goes into this. But Peter did not stay up all night. It wasn't like Pentecost and 9 a.m. Okay, Holy Spirit's coming. Um, cue the fog. Band, get up on stage. Um, hey, make sure the table comes up. When I do meet and greet, that's when you come up, okay? Then I'm going to pray. Um, hey, also, uh, Matthias, I sent you my notes. But, hey, um, let's go over them because they're really they're really heady. I got Joel. I got Psalms. I got, I'm quoting a lot of stuff. He didn't, he didn't do any of that. <laughs> so that he gets up full of the Holy Spirit, and he preaches this spontaneous word unctioned by the Holy Spirit. The question is, what, is, what, what are we preaching? What, what sermon, what, what's in our heart? I love that, that Peter, he, he quotes verbatim. He quotes Joel 2, 28 through 32, an Old Testament prophet, he quotes verbatim, word for word, Psalm 16, 8 through 11, and Psalm 110, 1. The, the word of God was just in him. 
And the Holy Spirit fills him and says, hey, uh, Peter, I have a purpose for the infilling. I have a purpose that you, you need to stand and you need to declare to these people because there's something mysterious happening. There's, there's signs and wonders happening, but I also have some clarity to speak in the midst of this. Because you see, it, it wasn't the sign and the wonder that saved or turned the hearts of people. It was the word of God. And this is what Peter says. He says, hey, um, they're not drunk. This is actually a prophetic film. In, and it not is just on that day, but it is happening in these days until Jesus returns where he says this. Joel says, in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Acts 2.18, even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. He's giving them a clear handle that God is showing them, hey, um, they're not drunk. That this isn't just, uh, you know, gibberish. They're speaking the mighty works of God because God is fulfilling his promise. God is empowering his church. God is pouring out his spirit. You know, this really Pentecost is a reversal of the curse that happened in the Garden of Eden. It is a moment where there is an infilling that God is dwelling once more in his people that only because of the finished work of Christ where he made access for us, that there was darkness in us, he cleaned us up, he can move in. This is a moment where there is uninterrupted fellowship, community with God. It is a beautiful fulfillment, and not just that, that we're being reconnected to God, but now that God is speaking to the people in Jerusalem. He, do, he, he makes it clear, hey, this is a prophetic moment. This is God pouring out his spirit. Then he goes on to say that, hey, the sign and the wonder isn't actually what God is wanting to communicate right now. Peter turns his attention to Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus. He says this in verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite, uh, def, uh, 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 goodness, definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Hear me. God raised him up. Loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He says this, that, hey, you, you crucified Jesus, but guess what? He could not be held in the grave. God raised him up. He then goes on to quote David in the Psalms. He says this, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Here it is. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Friends, you're looking for life. You're looking for the way. Look to the lighthouse. The Spirit speaks. God is shining the light, and not only is he the, the true source of light, but he has also called us to be his light bearers, that we are like the moon, if you will, that, that we are not light, but we just reflect the sun, that we just reflect the S-O-N, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. This is why there's such an attack right now and has always been against the people of God that, that a, right, a city set on a hill shall not be hidden, Jesus says. No one puts a light under a bushel, right? Remember that song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. Put it under a bushel? No. Okay. Remember that. There's an attack to put your light under a bushel. The enemy wants to snuff out your light. But there is a reality to your life. There is a purpose to your life. God has filled you up to bear the light, to show others, hey, there is a way. 
You don't got to stay stuck in the storm, tossed and turned and confused and hopeless. There is hope. There is joy. There is goodness. There is a God. His name is Jesus. That's our mission. That's our, we, we, we know God and we make him known. And so we are built as a church on the very word of God. We will not compromise. We will not water down. We will not turn to any other thing that comes into pop culture. We are saying, no, we're actually built on what's already been spoken. We're built on what our church has been built on for generations. This is our heritage. We are built on the word of God. And I heard a story of a lighthouse that was built and the goal was to be a rescue center. It was to go out and to save those who had been lost at sea, capsized, and needed rescuing. The, the lighthouse had the purpose to, to show, to shine the light, to be a beacon, but it also would send out its crew to go into the cold waters and to save the drowning souls. And after a, a few years, uh, the lighthouse began to grow and people began to build a city around this lighthouse. It was a beautiful thing. It was a center of life. It was a hub. It was a, a beacon. It was a hope. But it was also seeing people come. They were saved and, and rescued from the waters. And they would come in and they would begin to take up residence. The, the team would grow. The crew would grow. That As developments begin to, to happen as well, they got a fireplace in there and a kitchen. And they painted the gray walls a nice white. And it was now a comfortable space. It was a space that they wanted to be in. And the next rescue comes on, the alarm bells ring. And now this time, instead of the whole crew going, only half went. Now the next alarm bells that ring, now only a third of the crew goes out. And this time they notice that the sailors at sea speak a different language. And to their surprise, were of a different skin color. So they came back and they had a meeting and they said, um, we would prefer to stay in the comfort of our own lighthouse. And our lighthouse is only for those who speak the same language. And so we're going to decide that from this day forward, our beacon will stay lit, but our rescue crews will go out no longer. Now this... Rightly so, as some of you are feeling, how could they do that? Some, some of the crew was so distraught by this that they decided to go up shore and to start a new lighthouse. And this lighthouse, they declared, would be the biggest rescue-saving crew in all of the land. And they vowed from that day that not only would our beacon stay lit, but every time there was a call, we would go into the waters and rescue those who need help. The beautiful thing about this crew is that they were predominantly built of those who had once been rescued. That those who had once been rescued out in sea now saw the power of the lighthouse, now saw the beauty of the call, and they vowed that, hey, as I was once rescued, I too want to go out into the, the dark, cold waters and rescue others. Friend, I don't know if we've forgotten our why tonight. I don't know if we've gotten so comfortable in our faith. I don't know if we've gotten so full of just us or, man, that was a, a different season or I don't need to go into the waters anymore. But friend, can I just remind you that it was once us out in those waters that it was once us that were lost at sea. It was once us that were drowning and capsized and desperate. But when we saw that light and when we saw the people of God come into those waters to say, hey, come this way, I've got you. Hey, here's a, here's a, here's a warm blanket, here's a meal. Let me pray for you, let me help you, let me walk with you. May we not forget that that was once us. And there was a call on every believer that as the Holy Spirit fills us, not only are we to be a reflection of Jesus' light, but we are also to lift our voices and to speak. Come this way. Watch out for the rocks. Danger. Avoid that. That's not God's highest for your life. Hey, there's more. Hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, remember who you are. May we not forget that although we are different parts of the body, we all bear the same message. 
Jesus is God. Christ was crucified, but he rose again. He ascended into heaven, sent his Holy Spirit. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We may communicate that differently through arts or through gifts or through word. You may be on a stage one day preaching like this, giving a, a gift of evangelism and, and preaching in this capacity. But no matter what it looks like, we're all called to bear the same message. The question is, what sermon are we preaching? Are we preaching God's word or are we telling people about our opinions? Are we telling them about what we think they need to hear rather than what they need, what they, what they, do, what they absolutely fundamentally need to hear? God loves you. God is real. God is calling you. Turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. What sermon are we preaching? Peter preaching the very word of God. I love this. That 2 Timothy says this. Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that many men of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That God's word is profitable for all things. Everything we need, God's truth is exactly what we need. I'd love to invite the, the band up. We'll end with this. And the last thing I really felt the Lord just saying tonight, the Spirit speaks, what sermon are you preaching? Just, I, just, I feel prophetically this is for a few of you. I, I just feel this. Uh, it says, come out of the cave. Come out of the cave. You know, it's really easy when we're at sea to begin to look to things that will save us, to preserve us, to protect our lives. And maybe for some of us in this moment, maybe a lot of us, maybe some of us are, are, are hurt with God. We become frustrated. We become discouraged. It's not like, I, it's not that you don't believe in God. It's maybe you've started to not believe God. Maybe you've started to doubt his word. Maybe you've started to doubt his timing. Maybe you've started to doubt his presence. And it's really easy and if I could just be very honest with you, it's very easy for you in a place of discouragement to slip back in an act of self-preservation and to go and hide. It's really easy to, to hide. It's really easy in your discouragement and your weariness to instead of looking to the lighthouse, instead of going, instead of persevering, instead of Trusting, it's easy to just say, all right, well, I'm done. I'm, I'm too disappointed. I'm, I'm too heavy. I'm, I feel like I got an anchor tied to my feet, and I'm just sinking, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. But I feel led to just encourage those of you who feel that. You, you feel like you're in a, in a, in a, in a hiddenness, in a... In an act of self-preservation, you've, you've hid, you've turned away, you're in a cave. I want to take us to 1 Kings 19. And here we see a mighty man of God, Elijah. There's a great victory, a great mountaintop. But then there's a moment of discouragement. He, he becomes weary. He becomes full of fear. So he runs. And we're told here in verse 7 of 1 Kings 19, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched Elijah and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 9, there he went into a cave and spent the night. We don't have time to share the entire context of this, but Elijah at one point becomes suicidal and depressed. God, would you just kill me? The disappointment, the, the fear was just far too much, so he just wanted to die. He's on the run. He's in a physical cave, but I love this. And this is for you, that if you're in a cave, if you're hiding, if you're in a moment of self-preservation, there is no place, David says, that I can go from your spirit. 
that even in this cave, in this place, the Lord appears to Elijah. He says in verse 9, the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? See, the Lord knew, but he wanted to give Elijah a freedom and a space to bear his heart to God. In a judgment-free place, he wanted to hear what was on Elijah's heart. God knew why he was there, but he wanted Elijah to know why he was there. He comes to him in a cave. Elijah says, paraphrasing, God, I've done your work, but now I'm alone. They want to kill me. I'm alone. They want to kill me. I'm discouraged. It's not fair. I was faithful. Why do they want to kill me? Now I am in a cave. And the Lord says to Elijah, go to the mouth of the cave. He goes, and if you know the story, an earthquake comes and a, and a storm and, a, and, 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 and fire, and, and it says that God wasn't in any of these. But it says that in this cave, a gentle whisper came to Elijah. A gentle whisper, a gentle voice. I gotta tell you, the Spirit speaks. And he is speaking to some of you in that cave place tonight. He gives you a word that he doesn't just show up, but he wants to encounter you. See, Elijah had great theology. Elijah had great gifting, but he hadn't encountered God in that place. And some of you, you know God's word. You, you know the reality of God, but you maybe have not yet encountered him in this way. He passes by in all of these signs and wonders, but it says that God came to Elijah in a whisper. And he says again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now not to hear from Elijah, but for Elijah to hear from God. And God says this. He says, go and return the way to the wilderness of Damascus. He goes on to answer his question in verse 18. He says, Elijah, you are not alone. I've reserved 7,000 in Israel. That you think you're alone, but I gotta tell you, there, there's, there's, there's people in your corner. There's people who are out there willing to walk with you and, and to get in the water with you, so to speak. There are, there are people, not only am I with you, Elijah, but there is a people that are with you and for you. And I just feel led tonight, y'all, that God is just calling you out of the cave, that out of your discouragement, that, that he's saying, hey, there, there is a, a, a church here for you, that there, there is a people here, that, that I am here with you, that I, I want to I call you out of that cave. Just look to the lighthouse. Just look to the truth. Remind yourself of my word, that if I am for you, who can be against you? That if you are in me, you are more than a conqueror. That you can go far and wide, but nothing can separate you from my love. Nothing you could have done or would ever do would make me love you less. You got to remind yourself tonight. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Come out of the cave. Look to the Lord. Look to the lighthouse. His word is truth. You can trust God. You can trust Him. The Spirit speaks. What sermon are we preaching? Come out of the cave. Would you lift your eyes tonight? Would you lift your countenance tonight? Would you put your trust in Jesus once more tonight? Father, I pray tonight, Lord, God, that as we enter into this moment, Father, that you would have your way, God, that you would, you would complete this work that you are started, Father, that you are doing, Lord, that you would you would call those out of the cave, Father, that you would, you would break off the discouragement, the fear, the, the, the feeling of isolation, God, that you would remind them that you are with them. You would remind them that you are for them. You would remind them, God, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, says, repent and be baptized. Save yourself from this crooked generation. There is a call to get out of the cave. There is a call to get rid of self, to, to not stay stuck in fear, but to say, Lord, I'm gonna follow you. I'm gonna trust your word. I'm gonna trust your way. And so, Father, I pray that, Lord, right now, you would stir in the hearts. You would encourage. He's putting out his hand toward you now. Come out of the cave. Come out of the cave. Come out of the cave.